Hey AP Advanced Kids, in this video we're going to talk about forces in circular motion. So if you remember back to AP1, we talked about centripetal forces, which is just a fancy name for the force that points towards the center of a circle when an object moves in a circle. Remember when we talked about uniform circular motion in kinematics, we said that in order for an uh, object to be moving at constant speed but going in a circle, there has to be an acceleration directed towards the center of the circle and therefore there has to be a net force directed towards the center of the circle. So when an object goes in a circle, there has to be a force that points towards the center, and that's called the centripetal force. But it's not, that's just a fancy name. It's not a unique force. It's whatever force is causing it to go in a circle, like the force of gravity when a satellite orbits the Earth, or the force of friction when a car goes around a turn, or the force of tension if you swing a bucket over your head, like in a circle on the top picture here. Um, there are other forces, like the normal force, if you're on one of those rides where the bottom drops out. I don't know if they do those anymore, but it's a normal force that's keeping you from falling down on that ride. So lots of different forces, just our normal forces, nothing fancy. It's whatever force is keeping us going in that circle. Now, remember there are two types of circular motion. There's uniform motion where we're moving at constant speed. And in that case, the only accelerating force is that centripetal force. So it's only towards the very center. So if I have an object that's moving in uniform circular motion, so it has a constant angular velocity or constant tangential velocity, um, if the object's up here, the only force on it then is towards the center. That's our radial force or our centripetal force. Now in non-uniform motion, right, I'm speeding up or slowing down, which means that not only do I have that radial force, that radial acceleration, but I also have a tangential acceleration that's causing me to speed up or slow down. And because of that, that means my net force is actually a vector sum of the two. So um, if we take a look at the part right here, that means we have a radial force that points towards the center of the circle, but we also have a tangential force here, um, which we'll just label FT. Um, so it's a force that's causing us to speed up or slow down. So it's actually, I put it there just so you can see that this is the vector sum of those. Um, but it's really a tangential force out here that's causing us to speed up or slow down. And the net force is just the combination. Now, if you remember back to the Newton's second law, right? Newton's second law is the sum of the forces equal mass times acceleration. But with centripetal force equations, we do a lot of deriving. They don't have a lot of force equations on our equation sheet for circular motion. They do have our radial acceleration equation. A is equal to V squared over R. So I always just plug it right in. And so anytime I'm doing something that involves a force towards the center of the circle, I use, I just go right to the sum of the forces are equal to mv squared over r. However, if we have a tangential force, remember we talked about angular kinematics um, in our last unit, we talked about speeding up or slowing down when we're going in a circle, the net acceleration is a vector sum of the radial acceleration towards the center and the tangential acceleration um, on the outside, which comes from that change in our angular velocity over time. Now, frequently, we don't go in uniform circular motion. Frequently, they're speeding up or slowing down, and this actually happens a lot if we're talking about vertical circles. If we're spinning something in a vertical circle, if you think about what's happening, right, is that the force of gravity is changing directions every second, well, fraction of a second, every moment in time. So, in, in case one here, we've, our force of gravity is pointing straight down, and maybe this is a tension force or a normal force or whatever, pointing towards the center of the circle. But here, when the object is uh, on the side, right, our force of gravity still points straight down, but now it doesn't have a component at all towards or away from the circle. It's actually tangent to the circle. Um, and but our tension force still points towards the center of the circle because that's why it's going in the circle is that tension force. So that means we have two different scenarios that involve two different equations. In case one, we only have our radial forces, our centripetal forces, because they're all along the same plane that point towards the center of the circle. By the way, just as a reminder, remember that in circular motion, the center of the circle, anything that points towards the center of the circle is positive. Obviously, the tension force is pointing up, so we would normally say that's positive, but if 
they were up at the top of the circle pointing down, those would be positive as well. So here we have a, a radial equation, tension minus mg is equal to m a, which I would just replace with v squared over r. Um, but in case two, we have two different equations. We have our radial equation for our tension force that's pointing towards the center of the circle. So tension is equal to mv squared over r. But we also have this force of gravity, which is our tangential force. So that force, our mg, is equal to ma, normal a, our tangential a, our normal acceleration. This, remember, is the v squared over r. So when, in this sort of scenario, we have constantly changing force equations, which is going to really make it hard to keep it moving with a constant speed. And so that's why we, we will have a speeding up and slowing down as we go through a vertical circle because of the change in the direction of the force of gravity relative to the center of the circle. Let's talk about going around turns. Um, when a car goes around a turn, as long as it doesn't slide, it's static friction that is the force that keeps it going in the circle. If you slide, then it is kinetic friction. So if you start to lose the turn, you've now gone to kinetic friction, which is not good because remember the coefficient of kinetic friction is always less than static friction. Write a force equation for this scenario. So let's say it's moving at constant speed around the circle. So we would have our sum of forces are equal to mv squared over r. And so our force of static friction is our circular force. That's mv squared over r. So that would be my force equation. Now remember, static frictional forces don't just put in coefficient times the normal force because static friction is a variable force. It's not until we're about to slip that that uh, we can deal with a coefficient of static friction. So let's do that. What is the, let's do this. What is the minimum speed to make it through this turn if the coefficient of friction between the tires and, my, and the road is mu sub s? Well, now, see, I have minimum speed. So now for static friction, I can put in the static friction equation. The coefficient of friction times the normal force is then mv squared over r. If I drew a complete free body diagram, right, we have our force of gravity or mg down, and we have our normal force up. So that means I can replace this with mg, and that's equal to mv squared over r. And then our m's cancel, and we rearrange, and we get that this is the coefficient of static friction times rg. I like to call that the critical speed in a circle when it's friction, keeping us in the circle. Now, because we're limited, therefore, by the coefficient of friction of our tires, like how good our tires are, and the radius of the circle in terms of the speed, what some engineers do in order to make it possible to go faster is they bank the turn. So we didn't deal with bank turns in AP1, but we will in this class. So here is a banked, let me actually draw the, the turn right here, our, our banked angle. Um, what happens when we bank the turn is the normal force actually provides us with some centripetal force. So the weight is still straight down, but if I bank the turn, what happens is I get a component of the normal force towards the center of the circle. All right, the center of my circle, let me draw a line here, right, the center of my circle is still this way. It's not down the ang it's not down the incline. It's it's still towards the center of the circle, even though we're we're uh, tilted, and so that means that the normal force. If I make a little triangle here, the normal force actually has a component uh, that points towards the center of the circle. That's supposed to be an n sub r, so like a radial normal force. And then of course we have a y component of the normal force, which is opposite of the force of gravity in our little triangle. Now, there is a critical angle or a best banking angle is what it's called, is it's the tangent of theta is equal to v squared over rg. Well, where the heck does that come from? How do we get that? So what we're going to do is we're going to write equations for the x and y direction. Now, if we have a banked angle, um, usually the angle they give you 
um, would be like, you know, like this, maybe this angle. And if we went around and played with triangles and stuff, um, we'd find that the angle, that angle, the banking angle, happens to be up at the top here, which means that our X component, or the component that's towards the center of the circle is actually gonna be a sign this time. Kind of like when we deal with inclines, right? On inclines, I mean, it's the weight that's providing us the component um, down the incline, but it's the sign. So if we write our equations for this, right, in the X direction, right, we have some of the forces in the X are equal to MV squared over R, sorry, and we're not moving in the vertical direction here. So in the vertical direction, uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction just equals zero. So I'm not accelerating in that direction, just towards the center of the circle. Um, so when I write my equations, right, the force in the x direction is going to be that x component of the normal force. So we'll just write nx is equal to mv squared uh, over r. For the force in the y, that means the ny is equal to the mg, the weight of the car. So nx, as I said, if we played around with, with thetas, and you can do that, you can draw this, and if you like to play with triangles, you can move the angle around and find out that this would be the normal times the sine of theta is equal to mv squared over r. Now below that, I'm gonna write the y, right, which would mean then it's n cosine of theta is equal to mg. Now I set it up like this because if we stack the equations, we can kind of combine them together. And so on this side, I have n sine theta over n cosine of theta. So the n's cancel, and that gives me, right, sine of theta over cosine theta is tangent of theta. And then on the other side of the equal sign, if we kind of squish these together, right, the m's are gonna cancel, and I'm left with v squared over rg. So that's how that works. So when I have a banked angle, I get some help from the normal force. So I don't, even, when we, and when I say best banking angle, I mean that's the no friction angle. You notice I didn't even put friction in this equation. So you could get around a, a turn if it's banked enough without even friction. Of course, you go too slow and you're going to slide down the hill. You go too fast, you'll go slide up the hill. So you need friction if you're not going the best banking angle speed. One more thing uh, to talk about is conical pendulums. If you remember the lab we did where we spun the stopper above our head, um, I said there's going to be error because it's impossible to spin a stopper in a horizontal circle because you have the force of gravity down. Right? There's just no way. The force of gravity would be an unbalanced force, so you're going to have some, some down. So you're going to have a tension force that has an X component, which was what we were trying to completely achieve, but it's also going to have some Y component, and that's why there was error in that lab. So a conical pendulum, um, the centripetal force is provided by the component of the tension force that points towards the center of the circle. So uh, that means like we can make a little triangle here with our tension force. All right, so we have a tension force, I'll call it in the X, that's pointing towards the center of the circle. So that's our, we'll call that the radial tension force. And then of course we have this Y component of the tension force as well. Um, the angle to the vertical depends upon how fast we're spinning. And so when we did that lab, the faster you spin it, the more horizontal it got closer. The slower, right, it was like practically banging you in the head as you spun it around. So the angle of the vertical is dependent on uh, the velocity at which you speed, you speed, you spin. <laughs> um, so let's derive an equation um, to prove this. Um, prove that that angle is dependent on that. So to do that, we're going to do the same thing. So again, there's our theta. They gave us the theta. That's the angle to the vertical. So that means that in the x component, or the radial component, right, the tension in the x is going to be equal to mv squared over r. Um, and so that would be t sine theta is equal to mv squared over r. The y component, right, in the y component, our tension in the y is going to equal the weight. Wow, this looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? So that means that 
T cosine theta is equal to mg. And so guess what? We end up kind of in that same exact place we did on our banked angle, that the tangent of theta is equal to v squared over rg. So the angle is dependent on speed. The faster I go, the bigger the angle. And r has an inverse effect. So the bigger the r value, the smaller the angle, right? It's harder when it's bigger. All right, last thing, period of a conical pendulum. So if you remember the period of a pendulum equation, the period of a pendulum is equal to 2 pi square root of L over G. And my pen's not working, so I apologize. Um, but if we look at the L, right, that's the length of the string. Now in a pendulum, the whole thing was doing this, but now in a conical pendulum, it's doing this. So that means our L is actually the R here. And so as a function of L, we have the R would be L cosine theta. So. I'll talk more about it in that, that in class since my pen is dead. So I will see you in.